Welcome to Patriot Plus, Talking Politics with Larry Swikart. We're, of course, going to be talking today about um, President Trump and the indictment, and I'll be talking about some of the aspects of that that have come out regarding the Secret Service, uh, the gag rule, things like that. Um, but probably I'm going to start the show with something just a little bit different that came up. I noticed it on Twitter, and I, I think we need to... Uh, just spend a, a second or two talking about that. So we will get started here right now. Welcome to Talking Politics with Larry Swikart at Patriot Plus. Um, let's start with something that came up on Twitter, which has been in and out of the news. I've had it in a lot of my news feeds recently, and that is this notion uh, of uh, college. Going to college mm -hmm. is, is this great, um, desirable thing. And there's been a lot of research in the last seven or eight years that's shown a crisis, almost a pandemic, of um, underemployment. Uh, that's what they call it. And basically, this is the fact that the college grads who are coming out often take jobs for which they are vastly overqualified. <clears throat> and as a result, either they aren't really putting in eight hours a day work, they aren't really working all the time, they're playing a lot, or they are dissatisfied. And uh, a lot of this involves um, the notion that, and, and I know Rush Limbaugh used to say this all the time, you know, follow your passion, uh, do what, what you're passionate about. Well, unfortunately, most people can't. Uh, you might be passionate about fishing. Very, 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 very few people are going to make their lives um, fishing the way they think of fishing, you know, out there with a the rod and reel as opposed to, you know, the deadliest catch kind of fishing where you get sucked overboard by, by a, a hook in your arm up in Alaska. Um, let's face it, I have a fantastic job. I, I, I get to write most of the time. I'm a writer. I get to do these, these videos. But if I were to have to have followed my passion, I'd still be playing rock and roll drums. Most people cannot get to do their passion their entire life. Most people are going to have to do what we call work. And the definition of work is not play. I don't know if you know this, but if, if you go in the dictionary, there's, there's a word called work, and there, there's a word called play, and they ain't the same. Um, that's why it's called play music, right? Like play ball. But I, I hadn't thought about this until one of my guitarists pointed out that what, what we're doing is playing music. We're playing. It, it, it's, it's play. Yes, it, it can be hard work, yeah. But anyway, you get my point, that work is usually not fun. Work is what you do so you can have fun, so you can go off and go fishing or so you can go to Vegas or so you can go skiing or do whatever it is you want to do. But the simple fact is most people are not going to be able to do their passion for the larger part of their lives. And uh, on top of that, college youths have been told for most of their lives that they need to make the world a better place. Uh, if you've seen that great series on, I think it was Netflix, called Silicon Valley, uh, where all of the startups, every time they're giving their pitch, they say, and we want to make the world a better place. I mean, ah, no, no, no. So um, uh, most likely, whatever job you are in where you do work, you are not, per se, making the world a better place. Now, I, say, I want to say that as a capitalist, uh, in fact, you are making the world a much better place because you are supplying goods or services that other people want and desire and need, okay? And you get paid for supplying those goods and services that other people want, desire, and need. Um, but you aren't out there doing some do-gooderism all the time if that's what you think makes the world a better place. As a result of these factors, numerous studies that I've seen here in the last seven or eight years have shown that um, college graduates underperform, that they, they tremendously underproduce uh, what they should be turning out. And while our national productivity levels are very low because of this, 
and also they are extremely unhappy because they don't feel like they're making the world a better place. They don't think like they're following their passion. Um, and this is the fault, of course, of those of us who have educated them over the years to think that that's what the nature of work is, and it's not. So I just wanted to, to start with that because we do have an epidemic of that going on, and every survey I look at, it, it's, it's getting worse. And it, it was kind of brought to mind today in terms of the political sphere because McDonald's is meeting and talking about laying off thousands. Now, part of this is part of due to places like Illinois requiring you to give your employees, even a burger flipper, a two-week paid vacation. I mean, this kind of stuff is just insane. It, and it will put so many people out of work. It will make it almost impossible for people to get entry-level jobs. Uh, it's already hard in California you got to pay somebody $16, $17 an hour to fill tacos uh, and, and say, would you like fries or that? And nonsense. So this is, this is what's happening in our economic political sphere is that the rules and regulations now are rapidly causing uh, underproductivity uh, both at the top and at the bottom. All right, now let's get on with the stuff you probably really want to talk about, which is President Trump. And what's happening there? He is going to uh, turn himself in. They've had these negotiations with him about how he does that. He apparently is going to New York. <clears throat> now I'm going to mention this because Jenna Ellis, who should know better, she's a lawyer and I'm not. She had an utterly mm -hmm. idiotic tweet where she said that Governor Ron DeSantis uh, should refuse extradition and Trump shouldn't go to New York. Now, just think about that. That would make Trump a prisoner of Florida. He would not be able to go to a single blue state or even a red state that had a governor that didn't like him. Okay, so um, they would turn him in. They, they would extradite him the minute he got there. And it also would create a very volatile, potentially dangerous situation of police trying to uh, arrest a president who stepped down in, I don't know, let's say, okay, Tennessee. Tennessee's got a Democrat governor. So Trump goes to a rally in Tennessee, and Brashear, um, it's Tennessee, right? Brashear, is he Kentucky? He's Kentucky. And, uh, and Brashear says, um, uh, I'm going to extradite you to New York. I'm going to carry out this extradition order. Well, so he sends the state police and the Secret Service, and they have a standoff. I mean, it's just insanity. It's just not going to happen. So Trump's going to show up. Um, the thought is, listening to some of Barnes on his podcast in terms of what he thought uh, it would look like, they probably won't do handcuffs. I think Trump wants handcuffs. I think he wants the image of going in proud and strong and saying, yeah, they think they've got me now. I think he wants that, and I think... Even this moronic Alvin Boston Bragg, the DA, knows better than to do that. So apparently there's not going to be handcuffs. He'll just show up, um, make a plea, and, and leave. Um, but there have been questions about what do you do if you try to actually arrest a former president who's under Secret Service protection. And the Secret Service is not going to let that happen. And I think you can carry it a step further. I mean, it's not... A year ago, we would have thought this is insanity, but it's not insanity anymore, and you, you can carry it a step further. What if he was found guilty and sentenced to six months in jail? Would the Secret Service go to jail with him? They'd have to. I mean, it's just... It, it, it boggles the mind where this absolutely asinine idiot, boast and brag, has gone with this case and the problems that he's opening up. Now, Barnes opined that, for example, if they start try to impose a, a um, gag, a gag order on him, he can't talk about the case, Barnes has opined that, number one, this is obviously a violation of freedom of speech. Number two, it is obviously a violation of his freedom as a citizen to run for office. Um, and mm -hmm. Barnes thought that this would result in 
a fairly quick trip to a federal court. Now, I don't know about the New York federal courts. I think, uh, obviously, in the appeals courts in New York are going to be total lefty um, uh, pine nugget fields. But um, what would happen with the federal courts there, I, I don't know. Uh, and I would have to wait to see which federal court it went to. But Barnes was of the opinion that the free speech elements of this alone are probably going to force a rapid response by the Supreme Court. And as I recall his words was, the Supreme Court is going to have to get involved in this sooner or later uh, because of the titanic issues at hand with regard to the fact that you have um, a former president now under indictment for this really pathetic little charge. They're trying to make it felonies. They're trying to argue it involved, uh, involved his books and so on, which is nonsense. And Barnes gave a very thorough four-point refutation of why this on four diff different levels uh, would not go anywhere in a real court. Now, you've got to always say this because these, these lunatics in New York are going to convict him of jaywalking. I mean, it, it doesn't matter what he really did. It doesn't matter what the real evidence is. They're probably going to convict him because uh, that's what they do. That's why they went ahead with this trial there. They can't get him anyplace else. They failed to get him at Mar-a-Lago. They failed to get him in Georgia. Uh, they failed with the J6 stuff, although they are calling some of the Secret Service agents to testify. And again, I would think even that would be a violation of federal law because what they see in here is not supposed to be repeated outside their job. So we'll see how that goes too, but um, uh, look for them to try to impose this gag order. It strikes me that <clears throat> the more diabolically wicked and, and uh, repressive they get, the sooner the soups will get involved, that, that the more nutty Boston Bragg gets, the sooner it will be before other courts have to hear it because you're setting precedents not only for Trump but for Clinton and Obama. And, and so if they can do this, what's to stop uh, DeSantis uh, from having one of his prosecutors convene a grand jury to get Clinton over something if Clinton was ever in a state? I mean, there, there's all sorts of ways you can go about this if you want to play that game. None of it's legal, none mm -hmm. of it's ethical, none of it's acceptable, but if you're going to play that game, if you're going to get on the field, they can do it to both Clinton and Obama very easy. And the question is, do they want to get on the field? So DeSantis came out with a very strong statement, but there is a problem, folks. And I'm not ragging on DeSantis. I love him as a governor. He's done a very good job, but this is reality. You can't discuss this case as if it were just one of many people. Oh, it could happen to any of us. No, it can't, because none of the rest of us stand, pose the threat to the deep state, stand to take down the deep state the way Donald Trump does. It's not happening to you. It's not happening to me. It's happening to Trump. And to ignore that and act like that's a non-factor causes me to think, far less of DeSantis that he can't see this and understand the game here. It's not happening to Ted Cruz. It's not happening to Rand Paul. It's not happening to Mitch McConnell. It's happening to one man. They're after one man and only one man, Donald Trump. And so historically, if I could put this like I like to do in a historical context, around 1894, um, I'm sorry, after the Franco-Prussian War, um, the, the French were looking for excuses as to why they were just had their butts handed to them by the Prussians. They were just beaten very quickly. And, and it was embarrassing, humiliating. And they, they landed on a document showing French artillery positions that had gotten into Prussian hands, German hands. And... Uh, at the bottom of the document was a, an initial 
D, the letter D. And so the French investigators concluded this had to be somebody in the artillery who had access to this document, and it had to be somebody in the artillery whose name ended with D. And they settled on, they landed on a captain, Alfred Dreyfus, who happened to be a Jew. Isn't that interesting? The only one that they could find with a D who happened to do this just happened to be a Jew. And you have to understand, France was incredibly anti-Semitic, worse than the Germans. You know that France in World War II was the only nation to voluntarily hand over its Jews, that, that they didn't have to have the Germans come in at gunpoint and make them. They said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll give you the Jews. So there was a trial of Alfred Dreyfus, who proclaimed his innocence. <clears throat> he didn't give him this piece of paper, but the French courts found him guilty. And appeal started and the public began to get involved and a powerful uh, newspaper editor named Emile Zola published a uh, front page giant headline blaring J'accuse, I accuse the army of covering up now let me back up the army in French society was very esteemed it was a big big deal it was the army and the church and then pff, everything else I accuse the army of covering up uh, that this was done by somebody else, a Major Esterhazy, and that uh, uh, Dreyfus is totally innocent and he's a scapegoat for all of this. With uh, Zola's help, uh, a movement quickly blew up of people called Dreyfusards, who supported Alfred Dreyfus. And... Um, the French army knew that it had not done a good job and that it had probably cut corners and probably got the wrong men. So right away they called in another um, officer who was given a special task of like a special master to go in and review this case. And this guy was also very anti-Semitic, but he was fair. And he came to the conclusion that the Dreyfusards are right. Dreyfus didn't do it. He's being railroaded. He's being set up. And he turns in his report. And this guy gets, like, blacklisted. He's, he's like, you know, canceled. He, he's, uh, they tell him to stop, and they, they put him into nothing assignments, and, and he's told to shut up about the case. One thing leads to another. And by 1894, it's such a, a huge issue. And remember, Dreyfus has been on Devil's Island for 15 years. Um, that finally the government had to uh, again meet with Dreyfus and they offered him in essence a plea deal and they said if you will cop to a lower plea um, that there's like treason but not quite treason if you'll cop to that then we'll let you out of prison and he, he told his wife I can't go back to De Devil's Island it's too hard I'll die in a year so um, he, he admitted to this lesser plea and was let out. <clears throat> now, eventually, of course, the French government uh, pardoned him, restored him in rank posthumously, awarded him a medal posthumously. But, and it was, in fact, Esterhazy who had done all this. So why is this important? The affair. It was just called the affair, the Dreyfus affair, but the French didn't even use the word Dreyfus. It's like with the O.J. Simpson trial, right? You, you all who remember that, you didn't ever say the O.J. Simpson trial. You just say, oh, yeah, the trial. Mm -hmm. Because everybody in America knew what trial you're talking about. That's what everybody's watching. So the affair was about one man. Yes, the army was corrupt. Yes, the government was corrupt. Yes, the law enforcement was weaponized. Yes, it was out of control. Yes, they were anti-Semitic. But it was against one man. It was, all came down to one man, Dreyfus. And Trump comes down to one man, Trump. And I submit to DeSantis, you're not going to be able to pull this off. You aren't going to be able to support Trump by whining about the weaponization of the legal structure and the DA's office. It's just true, but that's not going to do it because it's not about the weaponization of the legal structure. It's about the weaponization of the legal structure against one man because of the threat he poses. And until or unless you get on that page politically, you're done. And I think DeSantis is done. He, he may be able to take a hiatus for a couple of years and hide his head and then come back, 
But I think this has really seriously damaged him, despite these statements, because he's putting out these statements that don't mention Trump, and it shows me he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand this is all about Trump. So, anyway, there's that. The other uh, story, somewhat related to that, I wanted to mention was that of Ricky Vaughn, who I used to interact with a lot on Twitter, and uh, Douglas, I can't remember his last name, but he, he faces potentially a years in jail for a meme. Now, it's not quite as, as simple as that. The, the meme he put out was directed at black voters trying to convince them that they could vote by text. And so um, this, is, this is vote fraud. Now, how serious is it? I mean, do, do you people really believe this? No. Was anybody really hurt by this? So far, I don't think they've shown anybody who actually showed them, well, I voted on and by text, and I didn't know I couldn't do that. So, uh, and so they're they're obviously after anybody who can use any kind of tech tools, memeing, advertising, whatever, that can damage them. While these guys engage in, engage in rampant voter fraud all the time, and the Carrie Lake case in Arizona is very important that that she is able to view and compare ballot signatures and do a ballot signature match. And of course, the Board of Supervisors and the Board of Elections, they don't want to do that. They don't want, it's privacy. It's, uh, felony is not a, pri a privacy issue, okay? Forgery felony cannot, cannot be excused by right to privacy. You need to be able to inspect these records. And so I'm just kind of guessing, I don't know the exact legal procedures, but I'm guessing she's going to have to go back to the Supreme Court and get a court order to force these jerkwads to open up the ballot signatures. And just my suspicion, based on how they're fighting it, they're going to find more than 5% ballot signature mismatches. 2% is the as an accepted level of fraud. People say, well, if it's 2%, this you know, across the country. If it's only 2%, that's, that's not evidence of fraud. But over 2% is evidence of fraud. I think they're going to find over 5%. And so it's going to be very interesting if she can get a court order because these guys will not go along with opening up the ballot signature match, uh, the ballots for signature match, then that's going to be a big deal. So we got really three ongoing cases here, uh, one involving vote fraud, uh, two involving vote fraud, and one overlaps, two involving free speech. And all of them involving the weaponization of government and the legal system, the justice system for absolute crap. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with all three of these. But as I say, I, uh, Trump's going to surrender himself. I don't think he's going to be handcuffed. I think if they do a mugshot, he ought to have MAGA painted across his head and give him a very optimistic but stern look like I'm going to kick your ass. I'd love to see that. Um, and the Democrats know this is very, very bad. They've been calling Boston Bragg's office. They've been trying to convince him not to go ahead with all this. It, it isn't working um, because the guy's whole career is all about getting Trump. If he doesn't get Trump, he's got nothing. Um, the third big political story that's out there. It's kind of an economic political story. And it's this attempt by the so-called BRICS countries, uh, Brazil, India, China, South Africa, now joined by Saudi Arabia and uh, many others, um, to get away from using the dollar. And they're trying to create their own reserve currency, whether it's the renminbi or um, uh, or, or something else, but I've seen now three or four stories by people I trust, including um, uh, Blackman, David Blackman, that you have now a situation where the petrodollar may be gone. It, it may be phased out, and that, that's huge because for years the petrodollar was driving a lot of this trade. And there's, a, there's disagreements over whether or not it's uh, the currency of exchange or the currency of 
unit mm-hmm. as to which is the most important. And I'm not an economist, so I can't I can't fight that out. I'm just a common ordinary history professor who can tell you this ain't good. It's not good to have all of these other countries seeking to and taking fairly regular steps toward creating their own reserve currency. It's not good for the United States. And you come back to the demented pervert in the White House, the rutabaga, who is manifesting all this stuff um, by himself as if he wants to destroy America. I mean, you could not, you couldn't list the things you want to do to destroy America and have anything up there except what he's actually done. Now, part of his incredibly pathetic diplomacy and, and uh, attempt to destroy America has been that we've we're increasingly alienating Israel and making Israel, uh, putting them in a much more vulnerable spot. The Saudis have now switched sides. Trump had a quasi-alliance between Saudi Arabia, Israel, and us. And now it looks like the Saudis are switching sides and that they are, they're cozying up to Iran and China. And, uh, you know, if you're biblical, this is the alignment of the Gog and Magog armies and all that sort of stuff. Uh, although Saudi Arabia was not one of those, those nations mentioned in that. But it, it's kind of interesting that, that Rutabaga, uh, bite me, has, has managed to basically isolate Israel after Trump had Israel basically integrating itself with everybody. They were landing Israeli jets in Qatar and United Arab Emirates and places like that that previously would have shot them down. I mean, it's amazing how far Trump came in three years to have these guys uh, undo it all. But Netanyahu now is in a very serious situation in that he basically has no allies left. Uh, he had good relations with the Russians, and that's kind of gone by the boards now with this uh, with the Uke War. He had good relations with the Chinese, that's kind of going away. He had good relations with Saudi Arabia, that's going away. Of course, the United States isn't really supporting him like we used to. So uh, it looks very serious for Netanyahu in, in Israel. And I keep coming back to this. The globalists, for them to win... They've got to take out three people, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, and Benjamin Netanyahu. Those three people stand against globalism, okay? Pooty Poot's not having anything to do with globalism. Uh, Netanyahu has been pretty much standing outside of globalism. Uh, Modi in India, he's second tier, but he also Mm -hmm. stood outside of globalism. And, of course, Trump. Now, you, you say, well, what about China? Well, G, G understands what they're trying to do. Soros and the globalist gang want China to be the world's workshop. And so they, they want it as part of the international order, but only so that it can be the workshop for cheap labor. What's interesting is that Trump wanted good relations with the Chinese, but by pulling American uh, investments out, Trump wanted to make America the world's workshop. Isn't that an interesting dichotomy there? So here's where we are. I think, um, I think Trump will go <clears throat> peacefully, go get um, arraigned, uh, won't go in handcuffs. Um, I think it'll be fairly quick. Uh, he may very well use this as a jumping off point for even more campaigning based on what he's allowed to say. Uh, with the the gag order, but already, as you saw in the news, he's raised four million dollars after the indictment. It's just an astounding amount. So anybody that thought, uh, as DeSantis did, apparently that this indictment was going to take out Trump and clear the field for him, it's not going to be that easy. And I will remind you of this: Eugene B. Debs ran for president in 1920 from jail and got one million votes in 1920, and he didn't win. And I'm sure it was it was harder. Uh, do I see Trump running from jail? No. I, I think that if it comes to that, he's probably going to go to jail. Um, but I do think that all of this stuff, the, the worse these guys get, the quicker it's going to be forced up the food chain to um, appellate courts 
and eventually the Supreme Court's got to weigh in on what, what are you allowed to do to ex-presidents for crimes they committed before being president. Again, it wasn't a crime, but let's just go with their language, okay? Um, what are you allowed to do? And uh, how far can you go? And, um, I mean, just think of the lunacy of this. You would put a, an ex-president in jail with other con men who would threaten his life, who would then want to know all the secrets he knows so they can tell their mobster buddies on the outside? Really? I mean, that's, that's where this is going to end up if they don't put a stop to it. it. It's just pure insanity. And there was a column today that I thought was just goofy that compared Trump and Clinton, and they're both survivors, and then the law is trying to get them. It's nonsense. Trump is nothing like Clinton. Clinton is a scale-covered slime lizard. And uh, Trump is probably the greatest patriot we, we've seen in the last 50 years since Ronald Reagan. So... If you've got questions for me, I'll be here Wednesday. Uh, email me your questions at larry at wildworldofhistory.com. We're going to stay right here on Wild World of History till I can get the Wild World of Politics YouTube site going. And meanwhile, uh, check out all the products at Wild World of Politics, especially the Insider. Uh, it has uh, the, the Reagan series of 21 videos, has all sorts of other videos. And folks, I've just finished recording three and we'll probably do another one today, uh, videos on the Globalism Then and Now series. And we're starting the Congress of Vienna. We're going to work our way through Versailles. We're going to work our way through the atomic scientists at the end of World War II, through Bretton Woods, and then we're going to get right up to Soros and Klaus Schwab and that, that evil little demonic uh, guy, Har Harari, his pal. So it's going to be a fantastic series, and it's all going to be up by... Oh, the end of May. The whole thing will be up by the end of May. Much of it will be up here um, within the next couple of weeks. So you'll want to be part of the Insider. Six bucks a, a month. You can't beat it. All right, guys. Catch me over on Twitter at Larry Swikart. We're trying to get all of my 93,000 followers to buy me a coffee. Just buy me a coffee. If 93,000 followers buy me a coffee, I will be able to make the video Patriots History of the United States uh, pilot episode pay for the whole thing and the Harmon brothers who do the chosen have indicated that they will take that pilot put it in front of their test audiences and if the response is good and it'll be great they will then take over pay the whole two and a half million to make the series and distribute it so you can be a part of helping to make an incredible film project Patriots History of the United States just by going over there on Twitter and buying me a coffee or going to my website and buying me a coffee. If you don't see the link, email me and I'll send you the buy me a coffee. All right, I'll see you guys back here Wednesday and we'll see what's transpired by then. <laughs>